you know, in the background nobody ever sees. But we see the musicians, we see the band over really there playing, and we see Mary Ann when she's up there playing, but most of you don't know that Mary Ann has to practice two or three times a week. And so we appreciate that. Sometimes people think that the church is kind of like the love boat. You know, you just come, you enjoy the ride, and you sit and you eat. And you sit and you eat. And you sit and you eat. You go to the buffet, the midnight buffet. The church is not like that. It's not like that. So if you're thinking that the church is like the love boat, you're in trouble. You're going to become a fat so and fall off the boat. <laughs> the church is supposed to be a lifeboat. We're supposed to be meeting together and then going out from here looking for people who are drowning and pulling them into the boat and saving them. I want to share with you this morning some <coughs> word pictures that we find throughout the, the Bible, Old Testament and New Testament, that help us see what the New Testament church is supposed to be. And the two verses of Scripture I'm using today come from 1 Peter 2, verses 9 and 10. This is New American Standard. It says, But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of Him who has called you out of the darkness into his marvelous light. For you once were not a people, but now you are the people of God. You have not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. That's a cool, cool passage because it really gives us the definition of the church. The called out ones, the ones called out of the darkness into the marvelous light. It also tells us the church is not owned by the preacher or even by the members. It tells us the church belongs to God who purchased it with the blood of Jesus. I think with that said, it's, it's serious business for us to know what the church in the New Testament is so that we can try to be that church. We want to try to get away from the traditions of man and hold on to the things that are biblical, the guidelines that we've been given. Now, I know culture changes. None of you came wearing a robe today and sandals. Well, some of you came with sandals. But, you know, culture has changed. So we may do some things a little different, but the, the key things that the Bible talks about are still the things that we want to practice. I mentioned with the with the kids, you know, the little ditty about here's the church and here's the steeple and you open the doors and here's the sea of people. Maybe you've seen this sign. You've seen this sign on the church of the Marquis before. What's missing? You are. You are. <laughs> yeah, you are. Sometimes that's true, even people who are attending church. They, they, they are missing. <coughs> they're, they're sitting in the pews, but really they're missing. They're just there. Church is a much bigger topic than just attending church. The New Testament church is very complex, really, when you think about it. But God communicated to us so many different pictures so that we could get an idea of what the church is to be. It talks about the family, it talks about a kingdom, it talks about a bride talks about a tree, talks about a vine, all these things give us, you know, an idea of maybe what the church could be. So let's look at some of those. Let's look at pictures drawn from family life first. The Bible talks about the household of God. You know, think about that. We all we understand what a house looks like, of course. Uh, we all have maybe different houses, different looking houses, but we can, we can relate to that kind of picture. 
We think about the church as being the household of God. The church is made up of people who have things in common, and yet they're not, not all the same. You know, we have different likes, we have different talents, different abilities, and things like that. But the one thing we do have all in common is Jesus. And so we belong to this household of God. Ephesians 2, verse 19 says, So then, you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints, and are of God's household. God's household. So, you know, it, it takes more than, than walls and a roof to make a house, a home. It takes a lot of love. So, in God's household, there, there's this love that we have for one another, even though we're different. Because Jesus is the one thing we have in common. You know, we have a love for one another. The bride is also another picture that we see. And I think we all, we all see that, you know, there's a TV program all about the dress on, on TV, you know. I don't think it's really all about the dress, but that's what they like to believe, because they want you to buy an expensive one. It's, it's not. It's, it's really all about a relationship between the man and the woman and Jesus. But the bride is something we certainly can understand and all the preparation that goes into planning the wedding and, you know, getting everything just lined up just so. The dress certainly suggests purity and holiness, and it's nice that when a couple, you know, walks the aisle and, and does that, that they are holy and pure, and they haven't had premarital sex and all that kind of stuff. And the same thing can be carried over into the church, you know, when we're thinking about the church. We are the bride of Christ. We, we need to concentrate on, on being pure and holy, you know. The wedding ceremony speaks about a lifetime of faithfulness and loyalty and commitment that these, these two are making to each other. And as a church, we ought to be making that same kind of commitment to the Lord. You know, that when, we, when we become a part of His household, when we become, you know, His bride, we accept Him, we ought to be making that same kind of commitment that we're going to be faithful, we're going to be true, we're going to Trust Him and honor Him and stay pure for Him. So there's a, a great deal of connection we can make with some of these pictures. We're also called a brotherhood. Okay? Uh, that's, a, that's a picture we see here. We all have common interests that we have in the church, you know. But not everybody has the same common interests. So, you know, you may have some people doing something and some job and other people doing a different job, but with all these interests that we have, a lot of good things happen and things get done. And the name of Christ is, is held up, proclaimed. Uh, in Matthew 12, verse 50, it says, We all have been adopted into his family, and Jesus is our elder brother. Do you ever think Jesus was your elder brother? Your older brother? <laughs> Think about it that way, you know. He, he gives you guidance, he gives you direction, he helps you out. He also makes sure you toe the line sometimes. You know, just like if you got an older brother, you know what I'm saying? So there's a lot of pictures that we can see here of the, the family, of, of the household of God. that helps us see that that's what the church is supposed to be sometimes, you know. So we can, we can gain a lot of insight from that. Let's, let's go to another one here. Uh, pictures drawn from politics. From politics. Church is a kingdom. We talked last week about, you know, why Jesus talked more about the church as a kingdom rather than as, as a church. Well, that was because the church hadn't been established yet, but certainly we can see several things about a kingdom that helps us see the church. A kingdom has to have a king, right? You have to have a king. And a king has subjects. Okay? Those, those subjects follow the king. Right? At least they should. And of course, we have the best king of all in the church. 
someone certainly worth following. Now, you know, you can study the Old Testament. You can certainly find some of those kings in there that, you know, you wouldn't want to follow. But our king, Jesus, we want to follow him. He's a good king. He's the best. Revelation 11, uh, 11, 15 says that the kingdom of this world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he will reign forever and ever. Kingdoms have laws, commands that you are supposed to obey. So we can see a parallel here between the kingdom that the Bible talks about and, and the church. Because those same things are true with the church too. We are citizens who, if we're a part of the kingdom, if we're a part of the church, we need to be obeying the laws of the kingdom, of the church. And of course, our, our, our rules, our laws, our commands are right here in this book. Also, it talks in, in uh, 1 Peter that we read in verse 9, chapter 2, it says the church is a holy nation. A holy nation. Now, can you imagine what the United States would be if we stayed true to what the, the forefathers that established the Constitution, uh, if we were still doing all those things? We would be more of a holy nation than we are now, that's for sure. Amen. Why don't we get back to doing some of those things? We ought to be uh, trying to become a holy nation that walks and talks. <coughs> Instead of hiding under all the lies and things that are going on these days. The church is a holy nation. And if, you, if you're a Christian, you have a heavenly citizenship in this nation, in this church. The Bible also talks about the church as being a community. A community. Uh, not too many of you took advantage of the parenting class that we had, but... Uh, it talked in there about how it, it takes a community to raise, raise a kid, you know. Take, parents, parents have to have the help of other people. And one of the most important uh, other peoples is the church. You know, we want, to help, we want to help raise kids to do the right things. We can do that as a church. You know, we, we can't raise kids from parents, but we can certainly support the parents. We can certainly be there to help them raise their kids. We ought to do that. We ought to teach them the right way to go. You know? So, all the people that are living in a geographical area that make up a community, they do have a responsibility to one another. And that's true of us as a church. You know, we are a family. We are a community. And we need to help one another. We need to, need to encourage one another. And we come together to worship and to make each other better when we leave. When anyone had any need in the early church, those needs were taken care of. Now we don't do that so much anymore because the government has a welfare system and all that. But certainly as a church family, when we see someone hurting, we, we want to help them if we can. So there are several pictures we can see from, I hate to use the word politics, but it just seemed to fit here. So, you know, whether you're talking about a kingdom or a holy nation or just a geographical community, we can see some pictures there of the church. There's several pictures from the Old Testament I want you to see. We're talking about a New Testament church here, of course, but the, two, the New Testament church was kind of a carryover from things that were happening in the Old Testament. And the first Christians in the, in the New Testament church were Jews who certainly knew the Old Testament, so there are some things I think we can understand. One of the first pictures that I can see from the Old Testament is the role of the priest. How, you know, the priest, he would be the one who was to go between God and the people. And he helped make the sacrifices. He helped offer the prayers. He, he did all those things. The New Testament says that we all are priests if we're, priest, if we're a Christian. So in, in a sense, we all have that responsibility of the Old Testament priest. 
we can go to God, God ourselves directly. We don't have to have a, a middleman. So the church cuts out the middleman, the priest, because we all are priests. Peter used this picture in 1 Peter 2.9. He says, the Christians that make up the New Testament are all priests. That's the priesthood of all believers that we talk about sometimes in the church. We all come to church and we, we offer our prayers, we offer our worship, we offer our sacrifices to God ourselves. Another picture in the Old Testament is that we are called the people of God. People of God. We're called the people for God's own possession. Here in, in 1 Peter 2.9. Another good translation is a people peculiarly God's. I kind of like that. We are peculiar. Most of us, as I look around the room, are peculiar. And we are peculiarly God's. Some other pictures from the Old Testament that we see the New Testament church being is the assembly of God, we have all assembled here today. We think of how the, the, the 12 tribes assembled around the tabernacle as it was put up in the wilderness as they were traveling from place to place. And they had their spots, they had their places, you know. And, you know, I don't know if they got upset if another tribe camped in their camp spot, like we do sometimes when somebody's sitting in our seat, like somebody up here is. <laughs> I had to see you up front today, though, by the way. <laughs> so the assembly is, an, is another picture. You know, we, we come, we assemble, and then we depart to serve. Another picture is the Israel of God. Paul, in Galatians 6.18, uses those words, talking of the church being the Israel of God. And I think what he was taught, trying to show us there was that we are a continuation of God's chosen people, the church. We are God's chosen people now. Sometimes we don't act like it, but we are. You know, we wear the name Christian, we ought to act like it. Sometimes we don't. And then there's a third picture I want to mention. Well, there's many more, but this is the only the three that I'm mentioning. The third one is Abraham's seed. Paul uses that in Romans chapter 9 and also Galatians chapter 3 to show that we, even though we aren't Jewish, we become Abraham's seed by faith. And so we're in, the, in that line of Abraham even though we aren't Jewish. Because we have been by faith adopted and, and grafted into the tree. You know, look at that grafted branch that uh, becomes Abraham's seed. So there's a lot of Old Testament pictures that can also show us this is what the church is supposed to look like. We can know these things. But let's, let's look here one last category, and that is word pictures we see in the New Testament of what the church can be. One of my favorites is Christ's body. You know, we, we are Christ's body. <laughs> and I think that was one of Paul's favorite phrases to use about the church. We know several things about Christ's body, who we're talking about ourselves here. It's an indestructible body, because it is Christ's body. It was able to resurrect. And we know when we go down into water, water and grave of baptism, we rise up to walk in newness of life, and so that we can be resurrected just like he was. Crucifixion and even death couldn't stop him. And he has defeated death, the last enemy, for us as well. And I like the way Matthew talks about it. It says, not even the gates of hell are able to stop the church or overpower the church. So don't worry about the church ever going out of existence. Because it won't. As long as we're faithful to the Lord, he's going to see that the church is always here, always exists. Another New Testament picture is that of the mature man. Paul talks about, you know, how when we first become a Christian, we need the, the milk of the Word, but as we mature, we grow, and we, we need solid food, we need the meat, until we 
progress and become that mature man. Ephesians 4 talks about this, about we becoming that mature person in Christ. We'll go from a childlike faith to being fully grown in our faith, hopefully, as we worship, as we study, as we grow in, in God. The church certainly can be a help to that in helping us to grow. We should, we should not depend on the church for all of our spiritual food, but it can certainly give us some good stuff. For us, the place is not as important as the spiritual house that we're building. You know, the, a, a church should have its solid foundation from the prophets, the Bible talks about, and the apostles. That's where the spiritual foundation was laid. The spiritual concrete was poured by the apostles, by the apostles and the prophets. And that's what the church is built upon. All the teachings that we find in this, in this book. As we fit all the pieces of this spiritual building together, we, we find a place where the Holy Spirit can reside and do His work and do His serving for us. We also find in the New Testament the olive tree uh, talked about. It's a picture that I mentioned already of being grafted in <laughs> You know, we, we are like that olive tree that, you know, the, the Jews rejected the Lord. And so he took the Gentile branches and gripped, grafted them into the, to the trunk of the tree. We also think of the vine and the branches, the illustration that the Bible talks about, you know. Who is the vine? The Lord is the vine. And we are the branches. And in order for the branch to survive, it's got to be connected to, to, to the vine. That's, that's, that's us. It's talking about us. We want to we want to survive and be be a spiritual a person, a faithful person. <laughs> then we got to make sure we're still attached to the mind. We can do that, you know, by being here when the doors are open. We can do that by getting into the Word during our devotions during the week and by our service that we do for for the Lord. So uh, the olive tree, the vine, and the branches couple of other pictures that we find in the New Testament. The qualifications for being a part of this olive tree, this, this vine, is, is our faith. Faith is what connects us to our Lord. We truly trust Him. We believe in Him. We, we want to be connected. And so we do the things that keeps us connected. You know, word, word pictures of the church tell us not only what the church is to be, but they also tell us what we're supposed to be. So I hope you'll take some of these pictures that we're talking about this morning, and you'll think about them, and you'll, you'll consider not only the, the church as a whole, but you'll consider yourself and how you fit into all of that. The Bible refers to Christians as brothers and sisters sons and daughters. That sounds to me like church is to be a family. When Christians are described as citizens, <coughs> as, as subjects, as servants, as soldiers, as ambassadors, I think we see a comparison there to the church being a government or a kingdom. Or, you know, if you want to use the word politics, you can. We have responsibilities as citizens, as, you know, as subjects, as servants, soldiers and ambassadors. And so we ought to make sure we fulfill our responsibilities. When Christians are described in the New Testament as, as stones, living stones, or, or branches. We see our duties and our nature being described there. You know, what kind of branch are you? What kind of a stone are you? What are you doing for the kingdom, for the church? The Bible talks about Christians as being strangers and aliens and pilgrims. You realize that those terms that this world is only a temporary place to, to live. We have, we're not home yet. We, we have a better place that we're going. 
We have a heavenly home, a safe haven. Pictures like the household of God, the bride of Christ, brotherhood, kingdom, holy nation, community, royal priesthood, people of Christ's body, God, assembly of God, Israel of God, seed of Abraham, mature man, building of God, olive tree, vine and branches. All these pictures give us a good idea of what the New Testament church is supposed to be. What it's supposed to look like. There's no single word or combination of even a few words that really gives us a good picture of what the church should be in the New Testament. And so we, we gather all these pictures, all these words, and put them together, and I think we, we get a better idea of what the church should look like, and what it should be. I think we would all agree that the church today is a far cry from the church that we find in the New Testament. But as Christians, we want to first of all know what that church is, what it looks like in the New Testament, because if we're going to call ourselves New Testament Christians, if we're going to call our church a New Testament church, we need to know what it ought to look like and what it ought to be doing. That's the first thing we need to do so we can know what we ought to be giving our time and attention and abilities to. Those first Christians, they studied the Bible. They called it the Apostles' Doctrine. They fellowshiped. Now, I don't know if they had a carry in dinner all, every week, but it says they were meeting together, eating house to house. It says they were breaking bread, which I think refers to the Lord's Supper. And it also says they were offering prayers. Go well, check that out. It's Acts 2.42. Those were the four things that the early church was doing. Those are the same four things that we ought to be doing. You know, sometimes people only go to church three times. They go when they get married. They go when they get baptized. And they go when they die. They get a little water thrown on them. They get a little little rice thrown on them, and they get a little dirt thrown on them. And that's about it. The church is much more than that. And I think when you think about these pictures that we've talked about today, you'll see the church is much more than that. Let's determine today, as we come to the end of this message, to be a better member of the church that we're talking about. Let's, let's determine that we're going to be a better church as we consider what these pictures are giving us the idea we're supposed to be. And hopefully then, we will be a better New Testament church. We're going to sing an invitation hymn today. And it's, it's an opportunity for you to make a decision about the kind of church member you are. It's an opportunity for you to decide, you know, what kind of church we want to be. So if you want to make a decision, we invite you to come as we stand and sing.